Welcome to Good Game, I'm Bajo. And I'm Hex. Ah, uh, Hex, spring is here. And you know what that means? Hay fever and screen glare. Yeah, absolutely. Also, it's a time to fall in love with games, of course. And this week we see which ones take our fancy, including some turn-based relic hunting. Also this week, a Brisbane-based team try to capture the spirit of the Syndicate series. And Hex, the most amazing thing to happen to racing games this generation. Uh, other players? No. Awesome upgrades? No. I give up. Puddles. Before all that, can you name the game for this week? But to get started, oh, I think it's news time, Hex, with Goose. Here's what's making headlines. Nintendo has named Tatsumi Kimishima as their fifth CEO following the recent passing of Satoru Iwata. Kimishima was the head of human resources at Nintendo and also served as president of Nintendo of America between 2002 and 2006. In an interview with Japanese business newspaper Nikkei, Kimishima revealed he has only been elected as president for one year and went on to say he would continue to run the company on the same course Iwata had set. And in more Nintendo news, there's been a significant restructure of the company. Among the changes, Nintendo's hardware and network divisions will now be merged, while their two major game development branches, Nintendo EAD and SPD, will also be merged. A whole new division known as the Business Development Division has also been created, which will focus on refining the business model of a dedicated video game company. Also, Shigeru Miyamoto's role has been changed from General Manager of Nintendo EAD to Creative Fellow. Electronic Arts has stopped supporting and removed 23 mobile games from various app stores. The list of games contains several high-profile Australian mobile games, such as Flight Control, Real Racing and Dead Space. Users who currently have the apps installed on their devices will still be able to play them, however they will not be available for purchase or re-downloading. EA gave no reason for their removal except to say they are now focusing on developing new and exciting titles. And that's all for this week. Thanks, Goose. Developer Turn 10's Forza Motorsport series has actually turned 10 this year, and with that 10th anniversary comes the 8th game in the series called Forza 6. Why do we race? Is it to prove how fast we are? How far we can go? There is no simple answer to why we race. There is only the fact that we always will. While last year's spin-off Forza Horizon 2 was great, the main series has had a bit of catching up to do since Forza 5, which was filled with way too many microtransactions and not enough tracks. Yeah, so now there is some stiff competition as well, with the likes of Project Cars vying for pole position. But Forza has brought its A-game, and dare I say it, Hex, this is the best Forza has ever been. Yes, the wicked microtransactions are no more. Praise Gaben. But there are well over 400 cars which span the automotive world, all of which can be ogled over in Auto Vista mode, plus plenty of new tracks and, most importantly, the overdue but very welcome addition of night racing and rain. And it's good rain too. You know, so often in racing games where there's a bit of rain, you're like, okay, yeah, it's a bit slippy, it's not bad. But with this, Hex, those puddles, they will mess you up. Yeah, do not underestimate the danger of puddles. Go into one with one side of your wheels and it will probably spin you out. Or if you hit a big one at speed, then you're going to experience the joys of hydroplaning, which often involves a lot of spinning. I like that you can occasionally use a puddle to your advantage, though. If they're sitting just on the corner at the right spot, they can help you steer through the turn. And those rain effects, Hex. I'm not usually a fan of cockpit view in racing games, but those raindrops were just mesmerising. Oh, 
best rain effects out there for sure. How did you feel about the fact that it wasn't dynamic weather or time of day though? I mean, everything is baked in, so it never goes from a sunny day to a rainy one or from day to night. And there's certainly no night rain. Yeah, it would have been great to see puddles grow dry or maybe the sun set as you race. And Project Cars did an incredible job with dynamic weather. But it's not a big deal. The weather effects work so well. And I'm not a big fan of races that will go on long enough that I'd actually be able to notice the changes anyway. But it is a bit of a shame that only a fraction of the tracks have night and rain variations. Yeah, I was surprised there weren't more to choose from. And it's understandable that it doesn't rain much in Abu Dhabi, so no rainy option there makes sense. Or the fact that night racing isn't actually allowed at Laguna Seca, so obviously it's not available in the game. But still, why not give us the options for the new Rio track? I'm pretty sure it rains in Rio. And I'm pretty sure they have night there as well. We should check our facts on that, but I think you might be right. As it is though, the night and rain does add a huge amount of variety, so perhaps we are just being a bit greedy. <laughs> Even after a full day of playing, I don't think I ever raced the exact track in the same conditions twice. Which was not the case with Forza 5, because after a day with that game, I kind of felt like I'd played everything and was ready to put it away. What did you think of the layout of this campaign? Well, it's interesting. They've gone for a more curated approach to the campaign this time, with the stories of motorsport making up most of it. Now, let's drive some cars built purely for racing. Yeah, and it's basically split up over five different series that work their way up from street races through to ever more powerful cars until you get to ultimate racing. And Hex, I'm not much of a fan of being stuck with slow cars for hours and hours and hours. I just want to get in there and race with the cars I like. And racing games have been moving away from that kind of campaign structure in recent years too. But I did warm to it here because they've done it quite well by letting you pick from a broad range of cars for each series. And each series doesn't take that long to complete, so you do get to play with some pretty fast cars quickly. Yeah, and they make sure that you get to play with a lot of different cars quite regularly too. One way they've done this is with their showcase events, which you'll regularly unlock as you play the campaign and jump into at the press of a button. These events are basically special races with preset cars that cover all sorts of things. So one might put you in an IndyCar race or have you face off against the Stig's virtual cousin. We have the next best thing. No, it's not the Stig. It's the Stig's digital cousin. Or even if you do a bit of automotive bowling, to name a few. I liked some of those events more than others. I have developed a new dislike for autocross, for example, which just feels like you're in a big driving test. You can completely ignore them if you want to, and it's good there's so much unlocked from the start, so you can jump in and have a go if you want to try something different. Well, one thing that's great to see is that they're a lot more generous now with rewards and unlocks. I mean, remember Forza 5 was so stingy they had to patch it? How could I forget? And although the credit payout per race isn't much higher here, every time your driver levels up, you get a prize spin, which can instantly net you bucket loads of credits or an expensive car. Yes, you definitely won't be lacking in cars or cash for long. Another thing they've added in this time are mods. You'll have to buy packs of these with your in-game credits or win them from prize spins. And they give you a bunch of cards you can use during a race. There are three types of cards. Single-use bonuses can offer a range of perks like putting you higher up in the starting grid or turning off collisions for a lap. There are also crew bonuses which give a small performance increase, while dare cards will hinder you in some way but can give you extra rewards. I thought these were an odd addition for a sim racer. And I know Forza, you know, in the realm of sim racers, leans a bit more to the casual and accessible side of things. And that's not a criticism, it's a good thing. But it just makes it more into that realm, I think. Yeah, they are completely optional though, so if you don't like them, then just don't use them. And Forza has always offered a great spectrum of assists and AI difficulty options, so you can cater it to just the right level of challenge for you. I think the mods are just an extra part of that toolkit. Yeah, that's true. And speaking of AI, Drivatar is back, mm -hmm. and that name will never not be stupid. If you don't know what Drivatar is, it's a cloud-based learning AI which takes the digital essence of your driving behaviour. And now that they've upped the car count to 24 cars on the track, that technology has made races scrappier and more unpredictable than ever. I love it. And the sound effects are as top-notch as ever, so when you've got 24 of those cars sitting in a grid revving their engines, Whoa! And it's always satisfying watching everyone barge into each other on the first corner or seeing an AI just completely mess up a turn. I mean, part of you just knows that AI learnt that from its master. Yeah, it does create AI that feels really human. They try to sideswipe you and block you or crash into each other just like real human jerks do. Speaking of real human jerks, Forza continues to shine in multiplayer. Online play is smooth and its ever-growing community of painters and models out there give you access to some great paint jobs and car setups for any situation. 
And split screen is back too, which is awesome to see. But we should wrap this up, Bajo. Final thoughts? Well, it's righted the wrongs of Forza 5, and this is a great iteration on a formula that was already pretty good, plus puddles. So I'm giving it four and a half stars. It's four from me. The first time I fell hard would probably be Monkey Island. My name's Guybrush Threepwood, and I want to be a pirate. You must master the sword. You fight like a cow. And the art of thievery. And the quest. The what? Oh boy. It's a t-shirt. Treasure hunting, you sea urchin. I'm a big sucker for the LucasArts lineage of the 90s, the grand apex of which was Grim Fandango, but it started for me, they had games before that, Maniac Mansion, etc. but Monkey Island for me was such a, an inspiration, it was so creative and it, that was one of the first game scores that I thought, that's just awesome music, that's just catchy and I, and I get all excited and goosebumpy when I hear it. Monkey Island was so funny, and so few games, even to this day, are actually funny. You can have your money back. How could I sell something so dear? Then again, a deal's a deal, right? Right. The Sierra Adventure games, which are kind of the darker, harder ones, loved them too, but Monkey Island is the king. Hey, at least I learned something from all this. What's that? Never pay more than 20 bucks for a computer game. A what? Hex, we may be in blockbuster gaming season, but that doesn't mean we can't fit in a bit of mobile gaming. Yes, and first up we've got The Executive, a game that combines the button-down culture of the corporate world with a werewolf apocalypse? The Executive is a 2D beat-em-up with some quick-time platforming thrown into the mix. The game begins in Silver Strike Mining Company headquarters, where a disgruntled employee beats up a vending machine, turns into a werewolf, and then the fight is on. And that's all we really know about what's going on. This game is light on story, but heavy on punching those werewolves. Yeah, a little bit too light, if you ask me. I mean, I'm all for saving the world, but, you know, at least tell me why. I think that's part of the game's charm, though. You know, it's about those quirky characters that you have to fight. As well as the garden variety werewolves, there's some werefrogs, weightlifting were-rams, and even sumo were-rhinos. And you fight all of these crazy creatures as a Clark Kent look-alike in a suit. <laughs> yeah, I do think they've paced it well, though. Each level sees you running, bashing through walls, and punching out some wear creatures. It's all very rapid fire, which I think works well for quick sessions. Yeah, I agree. Also, the combat is very easy to pick up. You just tap on enemies high or low, depending on where you want to punch or kick them. To block, you just hold your finger on the half of your character that's being attacked. It all makes sense, and it's quite fun. Yeah, and I appreciated how easy it was to just pick up as well. But then there's a good level of challenge in predicting attacks, timing blocks, and knowing when to wail on them. Yeah, it's spot on for a mobile game. I did have some issues with the difficulty spike, though. I played through all these early levels really quickly, but then all of a sudden you hit this boss that just takes you out in a couple of hits. It just caught me off guard a bit, Hex. I was feeling so invincible, and then this came up and hurt my ego. Really? Well, it didn't bother me so much. There are only a handful of bosses, and you can always skip the levels that are too frustrating. After each level, you earn a rank and some cash you can use to unlock special attacks and spells like healing. Alternatively, you can invest in your mining company, which gives you small bonuses for things like blocking attacks and completing stunts. But I can't say I felt much incentive to go back and earn a better rank for the levels I'd completed. There is a decent amount of content here, though, for the asking price. And no microtransactions, which is amazing. <laughs> yeah, overall, I had a pretty good time with this. It's got a great sense of energy and momentum that pulled me along and prevented it from feeling too samey. I'm giving it three and a half stars. If you ever wanted to punch a werewolf, this game is for you. I'm giving it three stars. <laughs> Our next game is from Square Enix, who seem to be taking mobile gaming very seriously considering the quality of their recent Agent 47 games, Hitman Go and Hitman Sniper, plus the endless runner Lara Croft Relic Run. 
And now it looks like they've crammed everything they've learned into their newest Tomb Raider game, Lara Croft Go. Hex, every time I've turned around and looked at you this week, you've had your head into this game just playing it. Yes, I am right on board with this. I liked what they did with Hitman Go, but that was a little too clinical for me, which I get suits that character. But with this game, they've given it an aesthetic and tone that feels like old school Tomb Raider, but at the same time fresh and new. I do get the feeling that the team at Square Enix maybe played a bit of Monument Valley and took more than a few design influences from it. Oh, I don't think they've copied it, though. No, I'm not saying that, but they've definitely moved way beyond the mechanics of the board game Go, which is what this is based on. Yeah, well, I think they needed to. Adding creatures like snakes, spider crabs, and giant lizards have given this a level of complexity that makes this more than just turn-based gameplay. The way all of these creatures have different movements and purposes is very clever. Snakes remain static, but will attack you when you enter their field of view. Spider crabs react to your movements and are handy at triggering pressure plates. And those big lizards will chase you if you get too close. And while you're making your way through tombs and taking out or avoiding nasties, you do come across spears to throw and clear areas, levers that open up new pathways, blades that are vicious but handy, and lots of gems and gold pieces to find, which give you access to a range of Lara Croft's classic wardrobe items, which is also fun. So Hex, tell me, why has this mobile game in particular wrapped its tentacles around you so tightly? I think it's just that drip feed of introducing new mechanics and the way they all work together. Plus, you never feel like you're stuck on a level, but it doesn't hold your hand either. This is probably my favourite mobile game that I've ever played, Bajo. I'm giving it five out of five. Whoa, big scores! I love the presentation of this game. It's just so well laid out and well designed, and I love that when you look at it, you know exactly what you have to do, but there's still challenge there. I'm giving it four stars. Nintendo's main man and mascot, Mario, has done pretty much everything. But back in 1992, he... No, you know what? He was still doing everything back then as well, including trying his hand at the finer arts in Mario Paint. Probably one of the most unconventional titles ever released on the Super Nintendo, Mario Paint was less of a game and more of a creative tool that allowed gamers to design pixelated works of art and then show them off by dragging your friends around and making them watch your TV because this was pre-internet and that was the only way you could share things. If that wasn't awkward enough, the game also came bundled with a rather drab looking peripheral, the official Nintendo Mouse and Mouse Pad. Only on the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. Immediately I was sceptical about this game and wondered whether or not this was a departure into the dark, drab and dull world of edutainment. Well, it didn't take long to realise that this wasn't the case. In fact, Mario Paint was, and still is, infectiously fun and joyous to play with. The game opens on a blank canvas. From here you could then choose different brushes, colours, textures and even stamp pre-made objects into your scene to create wondrous works of art like this one. Also, controlling the cursor with the Super Nintendo mouse turned out to be really intuitive and actually kind of fun. Although it did require a flat surface, which meant I had to struggle to drag a desk up to my couch and crank my neck and strain my eyes as I used the TV as a computer monitor. <laughs> Long-lasting injuries aside, it was all the small touches in this game that made it truly feel like a Mario experience. Popping sound effects, animated curses, official Nintendo assets, all backed by a soundtrack that would never become annoying. But if annoying music was more your thing, the game also came with a music creator that allowed you to place sound effect notes on a timeline and compose your own 16-bit masterpieces. I present to you the official good game theme. Along with this, the game was bursting with extra modes that allowed you to add your own style and creativity. There was a stamp designer, an animated stage to create little movies, and even a bug swatting minigame in case you needed to be reminded that you were still in fact using a game console. Thinking back, I can't actually remember if I ever created anything I would have considered art in Mario Paint, but at the same time I also remember not caring. It was a weird and interesting new way to use my Super Nintendo, and looking back, it's clear that Nintendo knew that the most enjoyable part of doing anything creative is in the process itself. Now, to play me out, I give you the good game theme as performed by cats! <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Thanks, Goose. Hex, can you hear that sound? Why, Baja, that's the music of cyberpunk. You know what that means? It's time to infiltrate a corrupt organization in a gritty fluorescent world in satellite rain. Cybernetics pioneer Dracogenics is making headlines with what they're calling instant consciousness transferal technology. But many are already referring to it as resurrection. In this is a scrambling for a piece of Dracogenics. The list of wealthy donors has increased with celebrities and politicians from around the world jumping on board. The Restech satellite network is expanding globally, making Dracogenics a household name Allegation overnight. Today is Satellite Rain is a real-time class-based strategy game brought to us by Brisbane developer Five Live Studios. And if you ever played the classic Syndicate series, then you probably fell in love with it. So you're probably like this for the same reasons. It's very possible. Satellite Rain is a spiritual successor to the Syndicate series. We did a Kickstarter to raise funds to go into production on Satellite Rain game. And one of the creators of Syndicate Wars is a part of the five-man Brisbane team behind it. And boy, does it show. Yes, this is oozing with Syndicate nostalgia. The basic premise is you take control of four agents in a cyberpunk city. This is a world where the rich get richer, the middle class turn a blind eye, and the poor suffer. Dracogenics have nobly provided their own private security force to assist in subduing the last stubborn holdouts of the city's poor and desperate. The city is dark and depressing, and the homeless wander the streets. There's a strong militant police presence, and this instantly makes you feel oppressed. Heavily fortified factories litter the city, and they're just begging to be infiltrated. Your small squad is part of a rebel uprising, aiming to disrupt and attack the oppressive organisations that have a hold on this city. And there are many ways you can do this. Your squad consists of four classes, each with their own unique abilities. And there's loads of choices you can make as you level up and progress. Where you put your ability points really matters for how you want to play these classes. If you want to focus on stealth, hacking and espionage, then you'll want to level them up. But if you're all about brute force, then you're not going to get far without plenty of health and offensive abilities. You'll also need to purchase gear, and cash doesn't come easy, at least initially. Besides completing missions, you'll need to hack and siphon money from ATMs located around the map. And there may be many more ways to make money that we haven't discovered, because I get the sense this is quite a long game, Barjo. Yeah, it goes pretty deep. And I love that you always have to strike this balance between keeping enough cash on hand to bribe civilians and purchase gear, but to also be funneling money into researching prototypes that you found during missions. And they've done a great job with the drip feed of abilities and gear. It just pulls you back in again and again. A new weapon to try, some new strategies to try. Yeah, there's always something to level up or fiddle with. And, and you're right, the more I played of this game, the harder it was to log out. Yeah, and I like that when you get a piece of prototype gear, you have the option of equipping it or sending it off for research. But if you equip it and die, then you lose it for good. There's some fantastic infiltration mechanics at play too. Scanning the environment shows how security systems are linked and powered. Cameras can be disabled remotely if you have the skill and can get there alive, but you can also just shoot them too if you're willing to deal with the inquisitive guards that turn up to investigate. On top of that, there's plenty of doors to hack. But if you have the cash, you can sometimes find someone to bribe, to get door codes, or learn about alternate entrances. On top of that, there's escape opportunities like zip lines, robot drones to deal with, and a variety of increasingly difficult guards to avoid or just take out. All of your actions within these bases are determined by your stamina bar. Sprinting drains it quickly, as does using abilities, so you're always watching and checking that you can make it past a camera without getting spotted. It's always intense when you miscalculate and then you have to limp away to avoid a fight you can't win or just don't want to be involved in. I love it when you get spotted and you have to take it all the guards or the cameras quickly before the alarms go off. There's a nice balance in how the difficulty of these fights escalates quickly. Yeah, and they won't always go smoothly. You can bring back fallen teammates or respawn them. There's an interesting system which costs you cash or XP depending on how quickly you want to bring them back. 
Bajo, I enjoyed these fights, but they're not without their fiddly moments. Yeah, that's true. For the most part, it is pretty clear where everyone's going to go and how they're going to move, but there are occasions where a teammate becomes a little unresponsive or just won't go where you want them to, and you'll have to shuffle them about in the heat of battle. I like how scrappy these fights feel, but they can be a bit frustrating. Yeah, at times even just moving around this world in a four-person squad can feel a bit messy. Some patches have rolled out already to improve navigation, but the pathfinding still has a few issues. Once you learn the quirks of the point and click system, those occasional glitches do become less painful. Yeah, my main issue was with those elevators where sometimes characters would disappear under the map and I'd have to fast travel them out of there. There's also a cloning mechanic where you can hijack someone's brain, recruit them for extra firepower, or bank them for cloning and apply their stats to agents. It's another little interesting mechanic that this game is just full of, but I was a little confused about how it actually worked. Yeah, I mean, most of the menus are really intuitive, but cloning was a little confusing. I just loved the presentation of the game, though. Just the way the camera's always slightly swaying left and right, kind of like it's a drone hovering, but it's also great that you can turn that effect off. There's some stylish yet subtle visual touches, too. Yeah, it's a great looking game, isn't it? I think the most fun I had with this was when I was going full sneak. We're just four cyberpunk trench coat cool dudes hanging out near your control panels, nothing to see here. And then I'm in, disabling security systems and sneaking about big busy bases, using cloak to complete an objective and then just legging it. Or just silently taking out lonely guards until no one is left. Overall, if you can ignore a few minor issues, then this is an impressive game that's just loaded with depth and dripping with syndicate love. Oh, the futuristic cars barge. So cool. <laughs> I'm giving it three stars. I'm giving it three and a half stars. So, did you name the game for this week? It was London 2012, the official video game of the Olympic Games. Released in, wait for it, 2012 on Xbox 360, PlayStation 3 and Windows. In the game, you lived out your Olympic dreams and competed in a range of sports including archery, swimming and trampoline. Well, just jumping up and down isn't going to score him any points here. I did not know trampolining was a sport. Well, now you do. And it's our name the game this week because the lead character artist was Dean Ferguson, who was the character director on this week's Satellite Reign. Next week, all hail the king. The Taken King, that is. But where has he been taken, Hex? Where's, where's he gone? Over on Spawn Point, our show for younger gamers on ABC3 this weekend, we try out our level design skills in Super Mario Maker. And don't forget, we have a daily show called Good Game Pocket, which you can find on YouTube and iview, and it's hosted by Muppet Man Nick Boy, who comes in every day to get the latest news and play Whoa. games for your pleasure. Dude, I'm so sorry. I actually saw a, an actual puppet go in there the other day. Yeah, it was like double puppets. Randy. Yeah, because <laughs> Nick Boy's a bit like a Muppet. Did you bring the snacks? No, but I did bring this rubber chicken. Oh yeah, we'll make this work. Sweet. Ah! Until next time, may all your games be good ones. Hex out. Barge around. Speaking of Pocket, I heard your Forza lap on Pocket the other day was even worse than mine. Yeah, well, what I tried to do was, I tried to do a handbrake. Explain it to me. A handbrake over the turn and then reverse over the line. Oh, but yeah. But I broke the car.